And when they find stories like this to write about at the State Department, that's the purpose. That's the that's the reason behind all this. Uh, 888-900-3393 on the phones team. I've got a lot more show. Stay with me. Buck Sexton. The Blaze Radio Network. Individuals and businesses with tax problems, listen carefully. If you owe over $10,000 in back taxes or have unfiled tax returns, we can help you take back control. The IRS is the largest and most aggressive collection agency in the world, and they can seize your bank account, garnish your paycheck, close your business, and file criminal charges. Take control of your tax problems now by calling the experts at Tax Mediation Services at 800-600-1645. That's 800-600-1645. 800-600-1645. You're listening to The Buck Sexton Show, only on the Blaze Radio Network. One of the big issues that's already come up has to do with vetting of refugees. Trump saying that there are seven countries in total that are uh, not going to be able to get visas into this country for a period of time. He was on ABC in an interview with David Muir. I just feel like his, I don't know, that guy's very, that guy's very Zoolander, but nonetheless... And this is what Trump had to say about extreme vetting. We're going to have extreme vetting in all cases. And I mean extreme. And we're not letting people in if we think there's even a little chance of some problem. Because we are are excluding certain countries. But for other countries, we're going to have extreme vetting. It's going to be very hard to come in. Right now, it's very easy to come in. It's going to be very, very hard. I don't want terror in this country. Are you at all concerned it's going to cause more anger among Muslims around the world? There's plenty of anger right now. How can you have more? You don't think it'll exacerbate the problem? David, I mean, I know you're a sophisticated guy. The world is a mess. The world is as angry as it gets. Well, you think this is going to cause a little more anger? The world is an angry place. No foreigner has a right to come to the United States. This is this is what the Democrats don't seem to understand or they pretend at least they don't understand it. This objection that there should be uh, what visas for people from anywhere. Do Iranians get to come here with the same frequency and the same ease as Englishmen? Is, Is that where we think this is all heading? Is that the way it's supposed to be? Are are we going to treat uh those who want a visa from Israel, the same as someone who wants a visa from North Korea. That's how we're going to operate. Of course, we make distinctions between countries. And he's not basing it solely on religion. He's basing it on the threat profile from these countries that do have. Just look at a look at the State Department, State Department again. Look at the State Department country reports on terrorism. Where is terrorism happening? Terrorism is happening in places like and then you go down the list. Iraq, Sudan, Yemen, Afghanistan. You look at these countries and you understand very quickly that there is a very serious problem. Uh, Syria. And they have already used refugee flows in order to infiltrate Europe. And there have been mass casualty attacks in Europe. And there are very real political ramifications for European governments from those attacks, as well as civil rights discussions and clampdowns on liberty and Remember, a terrorist attack is most horrible for the families of those lost, but there are also ramifications for the broader society, and the terrorists know that. This is why terrorism is different than a uh, you know a drug deal gone bad where a few people get shot. Okay, well, that's violence, and that's criminality, and we need to deal with that. But five people shot by a maniac in a shopping center screaming Allahu Akbar and saying there's going to be a whole lot more of me and you better keep surveillance on everybody who's thinking about doing this, is quite different from uh, a one-off you know, bank robbery gone, gone wrong. Right? We all understand this. The bank robber's not trying to create a societal upheaval. The bank robber doesn't have millions of people cheering him on. The bank robber doesn't have brothers in arms, perhaps already infiltrated in the society, who are going to be robbing banks for the next, oh, millennia. 
That's not the way it works. So we understand that there are distinctions with these things. Uh, But people just hate anything that Trump is doing on the security front. He also talked about torture. Waterboarding is not torture. I know this gets everyone upset, but not everyone. But waterboarding is not torture. Torture is a very broad term. If waterboarding is torture, well, then I also think we need to talk about the psychological torture of being in federal prison, period. The fact of the matter is we do waterboarding to U.S. military and training. We don't electrocute them in sensitive areas. That's torture. Journalists are signing up to get waterboarded to know what it feels like. They're not saying, sign me up. I want bamboo pushed under my fingernails. That's torture. That we have to keep having the same discussion uh, when we had how many people were actually waterboarded? A handful. I don't even think they're going to bring it back. But if they do, are we going to pretend that this is the end of Western civilization as we know it? I don't know. It doesn't upset me as much as it upsets a lot of other people. I do think, though, you're not going to be able to do it because who wants to be in charge of that program? Because the next Democrat might prosecute. All right. Uh, We've got a lot more team. Uh, Have a Freestyle Friday guest move to a Thursday coming up here. So it'll be a surprise. Stay with me. The Buck Sexton Show on the Blaze Radio Network. Team, we're joined now by Stephen Zalaga. He is an analyst in the aerospace industry for over two decades, covering missile systems and the international arms trade. He has served with the Institute for Defense Analysis, and he's the author of numerous books on military technology and military history. He's here to talk about his brand new book that just came out this week, Panzer Grenadier versus U.S. Armored Infantrymen, European Theater of Operations 1944. Stephen, thank you for joining. Hi, how you doing? Good. So uh, tell us about the book. Um, It's part of a series that looks at different types of infantry in combat through the ages. Uh, This one's a little bit different. It's not conventional infantry. It's armored infantry, meaning the infantry that serves alongside tanks, usually the types of soldiers that uh, go into battle on uh, tracked armored vehicles. Uh, In the case of World War II, it was on half-tracks. And so the you do you do a comparison a contrast of the U.S. U.S. armored infantrymen with the Panzer Grenadier in the book? Is that do you look at the difference in tactics, gear? What are some of the things you break down? Yeah, that's exactly it. The idea in the uh, series is to look at um, the different opposing types of infantry um, and to look at them from various aspects: uh, the training, the tactics, the type of equipment they use, and rather than just have a, sort of a bland comparison of the technical points the uh, the book takes three particular battles that involved uh, those type of forces on both sides and then takes a look at how well they performed um, and whether the contest was or the outcome of the contest was due to tactics or equipment or broader issues and so in this particular book um, there were three instances that were looked at uh, one of them was a uh, Uh, battle during Operation Cobra in Normandy in the summer of 1944. The second one was a lesser-known battle by Patton's Third Army against the 5th Panzer Army in Lorraine in September of 1944. And then the final one is a better-known campaign, the Ardennes Campaign. It takes a look at some of the fighting near Saint-Vif that involved the uh, Führer Begleit Brigade, which was a uh, uh, it had been Hitler's personal bodyguard, but it was converted into a Panzer Grenadier unit and thrown into the Ardennes offensive. So that's the way that it looks at the um, the different opposing forces. What tell us about that uh, that last unit? You said it was Hitler's personal bodyguard that was then thrown into the Ardennes offensive. Uh, did they w- were they a, a very useful unit on that front, or w- were there disadvantages that they brought to bear that the generals didn't expect right away? How, how did they perform in combat? Um, That unit actually, rather surprisingly, didn't perform especially well, and it was actually heavily criticized by the other German units. And part of the reason was is that even though there were a lot of very experienced troops within the unit, 
It had never really fought in combat. Um, as I described it, it was originally a uh, guard unit, actually formed under Rommel. It was unusual in that most of Hitler's guard units were Waffen SS members of the SS. This particular unit was actually formed as part of the regular army. Um, and so, as I say, there were some elements of the unit that were uh, combat experience, but the unit as a whole had never fought together in combat. And by this stage of the war, the German army is in pretty desperate shape as far as equipment. So to give you an example, as I mentioned, the book deals with panzer grenadiers, that is um, uh, infantry that would fight from armored half tracks. Well, of the, uh, the three component elements within that particular brigade, one of them was still riding around on bicycles. So that gives you some idea of the type of equipment problems that the German army was facing at that particular point in time. So the, the unit um, did finally overcome the American defenses that were on the west side of saint vif but at a fairly significant cost and certainly not in the timeline that the Germans had expected. How do the, uh, the the equipment and the tactics of armored infantry in this period, 1944, against the German Panzer Grenadier, uh, looking at it, I mean, if you have to tell me, what are the advantages and what are the drawbacks that both sides had when they were squaring off against each other? What, what would be your analysis? Well, there's two big issues when dealing with the World War II forces. The first of them is that this idea of mechanized infantry combat is brand new. So part of the issue is just equipment. How do you move the infantry so that they can fight alongside the tanks? And the common method during World War II were these armored half-tracks. But the problem with them is or was that they weren't really as mobile as tanks. They had wheels in the front. They had a track section in the back. They were not fully tracked like the tanks were. And as a result, in a certain type of soft ground conditions, such as snow or mud, the type of conditions that you would have seen in the Ardennes in December 1944, they couldn't really keep up with the tanks that uh, that easily. So that's one of the issues. The second issue is that armored infantry is usually part of an armored division. So typically, for example, in the American case, you're going to have three battalions of armored infantry in an armored division. But that is a very light infantry element within a division. To, to give it some comparison, a regular infantry um, division will have nine battalions of infantry. So they're certainly useful. They're part of um, combined arms. They're, they're part of a mobile strike force. But on some missions, there's just not enough infantry on the ground within these units. And so they have some disadvantages. They're, they tend to be very effective in the offensive because they're, they're mobile. They tend to have a lot of firepower. Uh, but in defensive missions, oftentimes they have problems simply because there's not enough riflemen there. A lot of uh, military buffs in this audience, military historians, uh, amateur, and and I think even some professional. Uh, what are the other books you've written in this series? They want to check them out as well. Um, there's two parallel Osprey series. Uh, one series is called Combat, which is this book is a part of, and that is the infantry versus infantry um, uh, subject matter. There's a parallel series called Duel, which tends to be hardware versus hardware. So uh, my most recent book in the Duel series was called Bazooka versus Panzer. And what that deals with is one of the iconic U.S. GI weapons of World War II, the uh, bazooka anti-tank rocket launcher, and how it performed in combat during World War II against German Panzer units. And that's another, um, that's another particular one that uh, used uh, the Ardennes fighting as an example. It used the uh, battle at krenkel Rosheroth. Not a particularly well-known battle, but uh, a very important one. And the um, the last one. I In your mind, what was the most important single most important single mechanized uh, mechanized unit adv advance that, or advantage that either side had in the Second World War? What would it have been? Um, the advantage that they had oftentimes came down more to uh, the the skill and tactical uh, uh, adeptness that the units showed in combat. It's, it's hard to point to a particular one. The German Army, for example, in the early summer of 1944 was quite good. They gave the British in Normandy a very rough time, the, their armored units. But as time went on, especially by the time of the Ardennes, and certainly even more so after the Ardennes, the German Army is in desperate shape. They're, they're, they're short of skilled manpower, they're short of equipment, short of fuel, short of ammo. So a lot of times, the, um, the, when you look at just the, the paper issues, you know, the strength and type of equipment, it would seem as though the German Army was quite good. But in practice, they oftentimes didn't perform as well as might be expected. 
And it was largely due to the human element, um, the, the quality of the troops, the amount of training.